welcome to our viewers at home, since we have none in our chamber, yes. It's, of course, our beginning of our provisional budget process, and uh, I'm going to call this council meeting to order. We have some minutes to adopt, and then we're going to get into two different reports. One relates to our 2014 strategic planning process, and then, of course, for the main event, uh, it's our provisional budget. So. I will ask uh, for the first item of business, which is a recommendation that the minutes of the public hearing held October 7th, 2013 be adopted. Moved by Councillor Morrison, seconded by Councillor Lefebvre. Are there any errors or omissions? All right, seeing none, all in favor? Opposed, and that's carried. Thank you. And also, I'm looking for a motion that the minutes of the council meeting held October 7th, 2013 be adopted. Moved by Councillor Lefebvre, seconded by Councillor Neufeld. Again, any errors or omissions? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. And we are already into the reports section of today's meeting. So first up, of course, is our 2014 strategic planning process, which you'll find pages 11 to 31. I will quickly introduce this and then I will open the floor to any further discussion, but ultimately what we're here to do today really is to bring this to the public as well. Uh, it is already on our website, but I suspect uh, we might want to um, do something by way of maybe a press release or something just to make sure the public is aware that it's there and available. And uh, let's talk about the strategic planning. So why? Just a quick comment. There is no page 31. It's 11 to 21. Oh, all right, thank you for that correction. So pages 11 to 21. So why have a strategic planning process? Well, of course, any organization, uh, any professional organization especially, has a strategy. It's vitally important. Uh, we are in this unique situation where some of us come and go, and sometimes it's as frequently as every three years. And uh, you can't run a city, let alone any organization, on that short of a time frame. Ultimately, what we try to achieve with our strategic planning process is continuity and consistency on a clear set of goals that really go beyond any one individual's time here around this table, potentially. And uh, as you know, Council, we were together for two evenings in camera working on this uh, strategic plan that you have before you. And uh, I'm actually very pleased with the outcome. And uh, this is now going to be an opportunity, again, for the public to have a look, but also for you as individual members of council, because there have been some changes made as a result of some of those discussions we had. And then at some point here in the very near future, we will bring this back for a proper adoption. Now, it is stated in the report itself, so I won't get into too much detail, but uh, this is a bit of a shift from what we have traditionally done by way of strategy. And as suggested in the report, this is much more of a process-orientated approach rather than what we have had in the past, which is sort of pick a couple of goals or a set of goals and then we'll try to achieve them. And what uh, I'm particularly pleased about, and I guess I'm looking over at you, uh, Oren, uh, is uh, an element in here which I think will go a long way to help the public understand our decision-making process. A couple of things pop out right away with the strategic plan. One is that it is very much tied to the same priorities that we are going to be setting and have continued to set in our budgeting. Uh, obviously, when you have priorities, you have to have that reflected in your budgeting process. And uh, it is ultimately also tied into some of the themes that we uh, heard from the community loud and clear over the past several years as we went through our official community plan update. And if we've done our jobs right, uh, these uh, various documents should act in harmony of one another and they should make sure that the city carries on with purpose, stability into the future with a consistent uh, approach and with some continuity in decision making. The flow chart that you see there, which is really designed to be a tool, illustrates very clearly that when we make a decision on a particular project uh, or even just a policy, um, there is much more going on in the background. Council is at all times evaluating every decision we make against a set of criteria, which you now have before you. And uh, I hope that for some, when they kind of question why we decided the way we decided on whatever the particular subject is, this might provide 
some additional background for them. And when you start to take any particular subject or project and you plug it into that flow chart that's contained in our strategic plan, you can see very clearly the various priorities that we have and how they ultimately relate. So I'm particularly pleased about that. And I hope that that will shed some light, again, on decision-making in Parksville. Now, I want to open the floor to some discussion around this strategic plan. But again, it's not the intent tonight to adopt it. It's merely to introduce it and to give you folks some time to reflect and, of course, also the public to have an opportunity to look at it. So is there anyone around the table, uh, and I would include staff in that, that would like to speak to this? And I see Councillor Morrison's hands up. Go ahead, Councillor Morrison. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just looking at the themes um, graph that we've got here, uh, I know we'd spoken uh, about having economic development at the forefront, especially given the light of uh, our latest talks on Monday night about uh, revenue generation. Um, we had talked about putting the three uh, pillars, which is at the front there up top, but then environmental sustainability is above economic development again. I was wondering why that got bumped back down again, if there was reasoning for that. Okay, well, that's a good point. I do recall those discussions. I think we, we did have a number of discussions around that particular subject, and uh, I thought we came to a kind of a middle ground where we might incorporate that in the actual where at the very top maintain our enhanced quality of life primary theme I thought as part of the um, description of each theme we might incorporate economic development in did you want to speak to that mr. Manson um, if I may, may your worship the I guess the theme the the, the way it's graphically outlined although it does um, potentially give uh, the impression that one theme has more weight than another. When you go through the decision matrix, each theme um, pretty much has the same weight, uh, with the exception of the maintenance or enhan enhancement of quality of life, uh, which, um, as you go through the report, is basically the trump card. Um, other than that, uh, each of these themes is a decision point for Council uh, to evaluate whatever the issue is against what Council is being or is trying to achieve with that theme. And each of the individual councillors, depending upon uh, your life values, will give a different uh, weight to what those themes are uh, as to your ultimate decision or um, uh, choice or of the outcome. So aside from the fact that this um, possibly uh, gives uh, the impression that there is some sort of hierarchy or weight to these, um, each theme um, by itself is its own decision point, and each counselor uh, will um, apply a different weight or a different value to the outcome uh, depending upon your view of what's best for the community for that individual item. Um, so whether it's, it's at the bottom of the chart or at the top of the chart, um, it really makes no difference. Councillor Morrison, is your concern in part, because I share it, I think, um, that it might send a message just by virtue of somebody looking at this chart, and I guess you know that maybe that isn't an important element to our overall strategy? Well, it was, it's just the way that it comes across. It has secondary themes and then additional themes. If they all have, kind of have the same weight, then they should really just have one heading. You might just alleviate the problem by deleting one of the headings. All right, can we just make note of that? And then, uh, you know, that's what we're doing here is uh, critiquing and looking at maybe some more additional adjustments. Now, who had their hand up next? I think it was... Okay, um, we'll go with Councillor Paul Davidson because I think she did. Thank you, Your Worship. My question was the same as Councillor Morrison's, but um, the response from the CAO is um, leading me to uh, um, follow up on that. We did have quite an extensive discussion around that at the last meeting. Economic development was to be incorporated at the top, and, and um, I do agree with the CAO that you know perception might be that because of where it sits on the chart that it is a lower priority for council. And I think perception is everything, and I I really do prefer to see 
it at the very least on the same line of the secondary themes or to go with as we were discussing to have it up in the top because without economic development and, and that's what I picked up from our discussion around the council table it, it's it's key to every other theme that we're looking at so I'm, I'm not comfortable with having it down there on the bottom of the chart okay very good Councillor Lefebvre and then Councillor Newfield thank you your worship <coughs> in um, in our discussions that we had about the strategic planning process and the strategic plan itself, um, one of the things that, that some of us talked about, I know I did, was that, and it, it relates to economic development, is the, the context of the global, national, and provincial economy. Because we tend to focus, and rightly so, we focus on the city of Parksville and what we can do there are forces outside of the city of Parksville that will have an impact on what we try to do or what we should, maybe what we should, shouldn't do. And I think that um, if we're going to bring uh, economic development uh, to the forefront, I, I'd like to see something along the lines of, you know, yes, we're focused on developing uh, economic development f for the city of Parksville in that context, but we have to be mindful of some of the some of the um, threats and opportunities or lack of opportunities that may exist, whether that be things like uh, um, increase in hydro rates, um, uh, whatever, ferry costs, transportation, so that we can, we can put all of these things in context. And, um, you know, potentially rising interest rates and, and all of that sort of thing, because we tend to focus and all of a sudden we look up and say, whoops, we have something that's happened over here that's going to impact on us. So I mean, those, are, those are just, maybe they're bad examples, but we should, be, we, should be, um, we should be looking at that because that, that, becomes, that becomes a factor. I mean, when, when we talk about some of the things that we want to do, um, uh, for example, maintain and enhance the quality of life, and there's another one on... Uh, on uh, on keeping taxes, maintaining a tax level, or, or de reducing taxes, well, those are, those are big challenges in this day and age. So, um, you know, we saw the example, for example, with, um, with DCCs when we raised the DCC rates in 2008, and the revenues, for a lot of reasons, didn't, didn't, didn't come, come to fruition, and therefore we're looking at that again, and so that there's a bigger, there's a bigger picture there. We have to be aware of that. Okay, and uh, I think ultimately we're talking about reflecting in our strategy, if I understand you correctly, uh, the realities that we are impacted by the global market, the global economy, the Canadian economy. The con we have to be in context because we can't. We're not. We're not an island. We can't. We can't. We can't. Uh, we cannot but be impacted by the provincial, federal, and, and global. Let's um, turn it over to Mr. Manson here. Um, if I may, Your Worship, I think one of the other things um, that we discussed at the meeting was uh, economic development, when you look at it by itself, is a very broad and quite um, encompassing uh, topic. What, what um, Council was looking at and what I um, interpreted from the discussions of Council over the 18 months before putting this together was what were the key components um, of economic development that the council was looking at. And not so much the broad brush stroke of everything under economic development, uh, but rather uh, the, the concepts of job creation, uh, the retention and attraction of business, and maximizing assessed values were the specific areas in economic development than we, that we were looking at rather than the huge broad brush uh, concept of economic development. So within that context, uh, this makes much more sense. Okay, so Councillor Newfeld. Thanks very much, Your Worship. I guess, <clears throat> excuse me. I guess one of the uh, concerns that I have is that uh, the primary theme, I think, is, is absolutely crucial uh, to uh, maintain or enhance the quality of life of uh, citizens here in, res uh, in, in Parksville. And, and I think that, that that's the, the thing that we have to look at. Um, and I, I think that to, you know, 
enable that to occur, we have to look at economic development. Uh, we have to look at, at uh, the social uh, consideration, whether it's uh, uh, here or, or uh, in the province. And, and I look at, at um, the aspects of, of job creation and uh, what we can possibly do. I think that uh, they, they are important, and I think it's uh, uh, to an extent culturally dependent as to uh, you know how we go forward with it. But I think that the the whole thing that when we when we look at at uh, sustainability and how we do this, all of it, the economic development, the the uh, social development, the the cultural and the personal development, is all very much geared to what the uh, environment will sustain. And, and uh, without the environment, without the water, without the fish, without the uh, logs, uh, without the human ingenuity, um, uh, none of it is sustainable. And so it's the economic uh, basis um, uh, of the environment that, that allows us to produce any growth. And so I, I look at, at uh, the sustainability as being uh, the, the key as far as the enhancement of the quality of life. And I think that that is absolutely critical. And if, if in fact, um, uh, growth is, is to occur, then, then fine. Uh, we just have to make sure that the resources that we use uh, aren't uh, denigrated. And, and uh, I think the, the, the illustration that we have is um, the urban skin uh, wetlands. Uh, they are critical as far as quality of life is concerned for the for the city of Parksville, for the water, for, for a number of reasons. And so um, uh, in, in that situation, uh, uh, you know, to have done a development uh, would have been uh, r ridiculous. And, and I think we all agree on that. Um, so I, I, I look at um, I look at growth, but I look at, at the requirement for the environment to be able to sustain that, that the growth that we're, uh, we're putting forward. And um, uh, so I, I see them as being uh, equal in, in position as far as uh, um, the economic, the, the uh, physical resources that are required, the, the, um, uh, the, the environment in which we, we, we base everything as far as any growth is concerned. So I, I'm, I'm quite happy to go along uh, with, with the primary theme. Uh, the secondary themes, as uh, Mr. Manson has said, uh, we will have our own uh, opinions about uh, what we would like to see first or second or whatever, and in conjunction with with what uh, uh, you know, the, the larger environment of the province or the uh, national or the international will allow us to do. Thank you. All right, no, thank you for that. So um, I know on page 12, uh, where it starts to talk a little bit about the themes, it does pretty much outline the importance of balance. And um, when we look at Parksville's community vision, um, I think when you read it, I won't read it now, but when you read it, um, it really does underscore uh, how important it is to uh, maintain our outstanding natural setting, our ecological features. This very much is a strategy that's based on sustainability principles. And I know we can sometimes argue over what that word means and, and how it's applied. And that, I guess, is our job ultimately going forward to ensure that it's being applied correctly. Uh, but uh, I, I do see that, notwithstanding, you're absolutely correct. Uh, you know, I think that the community really does value its ecological assets, and you're absolutely correct. I think we need to ensure that our environment is protected because without that environmental capacity, then the other two levels really can't exist, right? All right, Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship. <coughs> Unfortunately, I was away when you discussed this initially, but uh, Fred and I had had looked at, or he was telling me the process, and I really liked the process this time of, of doing this uh, strategic plan. As far as, as quality of life goes, and everyone is really concerned about that, when I was in council 30 years ago in Qualicum Beach, they had a population of 4,000 people, and at that time they were totally concerned about the way of life, development, and all that type of thing. I think over those 30 years, we've maintained a really good quality of life with the development that we've had. We're, Qualicum now has 9,000 people. We, I, I don't know what Parksville had 30 years ago, but probably around six. And now we've got 12,000. So 
as much as people are so concerned and get really excited about quality of life, I think we've maintained that over all these years, and I think that's going to be automatic to, to maintain it in the future. But economic growth comes, comes with some price, but economic growth, I agree with Councillor Lefebvre, economic growth is really to do with what's happening in the province and what's happening across Canada and the United States and the world. And, you know, we just can't force uh, economic development. It'll come at a very slow pace at this particular time because I think we're in a whole new era of development and we're not going to have the growth that we've had over the last 30 years that I'm talking about. So I think as much as, as we like to put this in paragraph form and, and think it sounds good and, and we look at it and worry about it, I think you'll find that we'll maintain that good quality of life even with the further development. And further development will happen. Maybe in another 30 years there could be, what, 20,000, 25,000 people living here. And I'm sure the people at that time will still feel they have a good quality of life. So I see a lot of concern over this, this paragraph and these statements, and I hear about it all the time, especially from the retirement people. That's all they talk about is quality of life. Well, we've had it. We've had an exceptional quality of life over the last 30 years. And the trouble is now we think we're entitled to it, but we do have to make changes. And sooner or later, we're not going to have quite the services I see down the road as we have now. But that's still not going to be uh, an effect our quality of life any. Because we don't pick up people's uh, trash uh, twice a year or their, their uh, plants or, or branches or whatever it is to chip, that's not changing their quality of life. That's just being realistic, and we do have to make changes as we go along. So, But, I, but I'm pleased with the overall concept, and, I, and I, uh, when Fred explained it to me before I left, I, was, uh, I thought that was a very good concept in how to put this together. Thank you very much, Councillor Greer. And, uh, you know, it's to your point, Councillor Lefebvre, I can recall when I first got on council, going back about 10 years, um, it was a very different time, right? We were in this sort of emerging, booming economy, and uh, the city was growing 4% per year, and the projections were somewhat similar. I, I can recall a time when the projections for our city really talked about 40,000 people, not just in the city, but in the immediate area around. And, uh, and I can remember sitting at this table, and obviously on the sides, but uh, having some real angst about all of the development that was coming down and, and uh, you know, are we going to lose sight of the small town character and nature of our community? And, and uh, I think there was, those were legitimate concerns, and they were certainly being expressed by a fairly significant portion of our population, not just retirees, people in general, because let's face it, I mean, we, we love the way we live, right? And then, of course, everything changed, and uh, the economy changed. And despite what we might have heard at our last council meeting, that it had something to do with DCCs, the reality was the economy completely collapsed. And as a result, we saw a lot of development go away. A lot of development never got started. Hundreds of millions of dollars of development permits that we had issued uh, really never happened. And it changed the narrative to a great extent as well. And uh, today now, I have far fewer people coming to me worried about the city becoming a big metropolis and losing sight of our, our you know, small town character and feel. And it's, it's more about can we maintain a percent and a half of growth? Uh, is it going to be a situation where uh, you know, we're able to keep the vibrancy here and, and keep the city functioning in a way that you know, is going to ultimately, again, uh, preserve and protect that quality of life? It's interesting, and maybe that speaks to why we need to have a good, solid strategic plan, because as these things shift, right, your decision-making shifts a little bit as well. And we always have to keep in mind that, you know, economies also go up and down, and things can change over time, and maintaining a certain set of goals and priorities is very important. But it certainly changed the whole conversations that we've had around this table. Would you agree? Yeah. Would you agree, Councillor Lefebvre? Yeah, I'm just talking to some of the folks that have been here the longest, and, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what tomorrow brings. Go ahead, Councilor Lafayette. Uh, one, one particular issue that I, I've talked about too much, and I know people start rolling their eyes, but I, I was just talking to the CAO before this meeting, and I, in the Globe and Mail yesterday, there's under the heading of global security, it's the age of the water wars, and it's, we lose sight of that. You know, this, this, I admit this is global, and, and we're, we're, we both discussed earlier today that we're extremely, extremely fortunate to have water. 
because of the rain and because of some of the initiatives that we're taking. But if you'll permit me, I'd like to just read just a few, a few sentences. The author is the geostrategist and author of the most recently of a book called Water, Peace, and War. It says, water stress is also imposing mounting socioeconomic costs. For example, commercial or state decisions in many countries on where to set up new manufacturing or energy, energy plants are increasingly being constrained by inadequate water availability. So that now the issue of water is entering into economic decision making. Do I have enough water? What will be the impact if I use this water on, on the rest of, on the, rest of uh, the people in the area? And it, and it goes on to say, consumption growth has become the single biggest driver of water stress. Rising incomes, for example, have promoted richer diets, especially a greater intake of meat, whose production is notoriously water intensive. For example, it's about 10 times more water intensive to produce beef than to produce cereals. In this light, water is becoming the world's next majority sec major security and economic challenge. So, you know, we, we don't have the problem. I, I want to stress that right now. But there's a lot of other people that do. And I think that it be behooves us to make sure that we, we, when we make decisions of an economic nature, that that's taken into consideration in terms of how we use our water and what will the impact be on our water. Right. And, you know, we are actually impacted by that here right now. I mean, when you think about the context of that DCC discussion, it's about capacity. It's about making sure we have the water supply available. Uh, all of the efforts around ASR and our treatment plant and our new intake is about making sure that we have that uh, supply of freely available and meeting all the legislative requirements. And ultimately, as we've said, and we've said it at this table, if we're unable to do that, then we're not going to even be in a position to see further development or any sort of economic initiatives because we simply don't have a fundamental um, resource such as water available. So, yeah, it's a good point. Any further comments? If not, what we can do is uh, table this until the next meeting, and that'll provide some time to um, have you all further reflect upon some of those uh, specific elements. I know we're not going into it in great detail here today, but we'll make sure that uh, the public's aware that they can have an opportunity to review it as well and provide input, and then we'll get back together here, and based on our discussions, we may tweak it a little bit. I think we're mostly there, but... All right, so just a motion to table by Councillor Greer, seconded by Councillor Powell. No discussion on the tabling motion, of course. Is that correct, Debbie? <laughs> All in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number two, which is, of course, the beginning of our provisional budgeting process. And we have a verbal report as well as, I believe, a PowerPoint. And I will leave it with you, Pamela. Thank you, Your Worship. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the City of Parksville um, Provisional Financial Plan for the 2014-2018 fiscal period. Let so me we'll just stop you right there because I just noticed we have a Qualicum Beach Councillor at the back of the room, Councillor Dave Willie. I'm sure he's here to get some pointers on a good budgeting process, so <laughs> please provide your advice to him. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. So we'll basically be looking at all of the three funds, the general fund, the water fund, and the sewer fund, and looking at the same items in each of the funds, which are budget adjustments, uh, ser uh, pri service priority comparison, the 20-year capital plan, and the 2014 provisional financial plan for each of the funds. So we'll get started with the general fund. So our 2014 to 2018 budget building blocks were tax increases of 2.5% for all the five years, an inflation rate of 2% from 2014 to 2016, and then 25 after that. And then the 2014 operational costs were to remain at 2012 level, levels for the bottom four service priority levels. Okay, and uh, yes, by all means, Council, if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll try to see it. So go ahead, Council Lefebvre. Nice, su succinct question. I'm just uh, suggesting that inflation rate at 2% for 2014 to 16, then 2.5, I'd put an asterisk, you know, saying provided the world doesn't, just something else doesn't happen. I, I, know, I know you mean that. We revise it every year, but that's not necessarily something we can take to the bank, but I, I understand. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Councillor Lefebvre. Um, so the budget adjustments for the 2014 budget, we reviewed and adjusted the capital expenditures. 
we reviewed and adjusted the dcc program projects and that's in conjunction with our dcc ongoing review at the time we've adjusted the reserve balances so that they were brought up to date based on the two thousand and twelve surpluses that we encountered there was an increase in corporate training costs there was a reduction in the council convention costs and that's basically due to the fcm not being in vancouver this year the parks and the public works expenses were reviewed and adjusted and then we had our twenty fourteen spending package requests so the spending package requests can sorry can composed of two different areas the opera the operating side and the capital side so on the operating side the requests that were put forward were ipads the smart board for the new boardroom in the in min area conferencing software for the new smart boards as well as the other smart boards to connect them cross lay hose bed for uh, the fire equipment e42 that's modifications for that uh, co-op student for the engineering department and this is contingent on one of the um, spending packages in the capital side which I'll enhance on when I get on to there um, for the parks area we there's an auctions weed program that's come forward and the Shelley Road Center exterior painting has been proposed for them all right go ahead council the faith um, this is a, this I, this is a serious question and I don't mean to be uh, flippant what are the advantages or what are the uh, I guess what are the advantages of smart boards and the conference for smart boards can you can you explain that to me uh, it's, it's a fairly big expenditure what are the advantages to smart boards I, I I've never used a smart board so and I won't say the obvious thing there go ahead <laughs> mr. Matz um, you 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 have seen the smart board it's I've uh, seen it I don't know how it works I've tried to work it I can't I you're making this really hard on me. Go ahead, Mr. Mann. Basically, what the conferencing software does is it links uh, all of the soft boards that we have in the city together. Um, and this is more of an emergency preparedness uh, type of issue, uh, so that if we're using the one here in, a, in an emergency, um, the one that's down at Public Works and Engineering, the one that's in the fire hall, um, and the one that we're proposing essentially for councils um, um, edification in the event of emergency um, all of them will be displaying exactly the same information councillor Powell thank you worship I just want to go back to, to the 14 iPads it was me right? <laughs> It was me that brought this forward, and one of the reasons I brought it forward was to start going paperless. And we had this discussion at the library board as well because we were going paperless there too. And there was the discussion that the library board purchased all the iPads. That's cost prohibitive. And so what we left it with is that the specific uh, representatives could bring their own iPad and work it that way. And nobody is getting an iPad unless they buy their own. And so the 14 iPads there's seven of us and then the other seven or four your staff okay thanks well just a quick question for you councillor Powell because I know you do bring your iPad to our council meetings and I can hear you typing away there during the meetings so you're typing sort of notes to yourself minutes and you're finding it works really well I am when I have a really difficult time reading my own writing and so if I type it out at least I have it there and I just use keywords because I like to go back and re reflect and see what was said at the meeting, so that's why I do that. But if I had, if we could access the minutes on our iPad, like when I get the minutes, I read them and I make notes, and you, it'll give us the ability to do that on the iPad and then just bring it in. So to me, that's a really good solution, and we do that at the library board, and it's a good solution. It works really well, but then I question the cost of pr providing us with iPads because that uh, certainly wasn't my intention when I brought it forward it was I have an iPad I'd like to be able to use it uh, Councillor Lefebvre you have an iPad that's been issued to you by the regional district yes, I do, right yes. and I believe the other directors as well yes do you, uh, how are you finding it it's uh, it's very very handy it's extremely handy you can get um, 
when uh, when the meetings are going on, uh, you you have the ability to um, to uh, circle for questions that you can ask based on questions that are being asked. Uh, it's 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 handy. It's, it, most of us are using it now. I uh, sometimes the Wi-Fi is a problem. There are some technical glitches, but there's somebody there that can can uh, can. That's we need that here because if there's a glitch, somebody needs to help out. You know because I can't do it. Okay, thank you for that. So if uh, oh, oh, go ahead, uh, Madam Thomas. Um, yes, Your Worship, we have an application that um, we already have. It came part as part of our meeting manager software package that we can uh, can be is applicable to iPads that allow, would allow council to have their agendas and their minutes on the iPad. They would be able to annotate their um, agendas. They would be able to write notes in the margin highlight sections of reports that they wanted to raise or ask questions about, and then they can either save their notes with their agendas or they can just delete them as they wish. So it, it, it is a, a fairly useful tool, um, but unfortunately the product only works with iPads. There isn't an Android option available. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Go ahead, Councillor Greer. Thank you, Richard. Um, I have no trouble with us all having iPads. I do have trouble with the city paying for them. I think I agree with, with my collier here. Um, the other thing was the new smart board. I thought we spent a considerable amount of money two or three years ago on smart boards and all that equipment that we have in the, in, in the um, 100 room there. And are we now, is, that no, is, it, is this now obsolete and we're going further than that? Because it seems like an awful lot of expense. How important is it that we have that? I mean, is it important that we have it this year? If, <clears throat> Go ahead, Mr. Manson. If I may, Your Worship, um, the discussion that we had several years ago with regards to the smart board uh, linking software, uh, that is something that Council did not approve at that time. Um, I can't say that I'm a, an overly enthusiastic proponent for it. Uh, but it is something that our emergency preparedness staff uh, feel should be there. Um, that, that's the $7,500. Um, the uh, $10,000 item is for another smart board uh, to be put in the um, additional council committee room uh, in administration. And again, this is something for uh, emergency preparedness or at least that's the main benefit that will arise, in that that's the place that council uh, would be congregating uh, in an emergency uh, so that council could see exactly uh, what we were seeing here in the emergency operations center. Um, that's, that's the gist of having the additional smart board and the gist of having the uh, linking software. Uh, that same linking software would allow the uh, smart board in the fire department uh, to see what's going on here and the smart board that's in the uh, uh, in engineering uh, to also see exactly what's going on in here. Just a follow up. All right, so follow up, Councillor Greer, and then we probably should start moving along. So what you're saying is the fact that it's something that we want that's not necessarily that we need. And, and what I what I gather is it's all to do with emergencies and who's to say what emergency it's going to be and whether anybody's going to be here to look at a, a smart board or who's who might even be at the fire station to look at a smart board depends on what the emergency is if it's a, if it's a, um, um, an earthquake and the whole town is split no one's going to go anywhere anyways. The trucks aren't going to leave the fire hall and um, probably people aren't even going to get to the fire hall and councillors are not going to get to the city hall. So to say that this is going to solve all these problems, it's, it's, it's really questionable. But in fairness, it may not be that the entire city has been swallowed up. Sure. Uh, it may be that um, we have a situation where it might be important to be able to communicate back and forth. We have certain roles and responsibilities as elected officials. Obviously, we don't want to be rubbing shoulders with the emergency operations professionals who are going to be doing everything they can to maintain things. 
Uh, why, don't we, why don't we put an asterisk on this, because yeah. we're not making okay. a decision tonight, no. and give it some further thought and talk okay. with the individual members of staff, and maybe even talk with our fire chief and other emergency personnel and see what they think, and we will definitely carry on. So, Council Lefebvre. Thank you, Worship. Uh, very quickly, the noxious weed program is going to be only on city property, and is, it, is this something we will do from time to time? It's not an annual program. Only on city property, and... Um, Go ahead, Mr. Metcalf. Through your, you, Your Worship, um, the program itself is going to initially address the um, the knotweed, Japanese knotweed, as well as the hogweed. Uh, we've been getting increasing complaints about those um, those on city property. It would only be addressing those on city property. Part of the program, as well, is that there, it, it, with Japanese knotweed, it's you can't dispose of it in your green bin. You can't dispose of it in the normal way that you dispose of it. So part of that program would as well to be have a disposal, um, a, a people to give people the option of bringing it to the work shard in a plastic bag, and then we would dispose of it properly. So that would also be part of that program too. And the idea would be that it, in, with regards to ongoing, uh, we we did include it um, with this package over a five-year period of time. The hope would be over that over that time that we would start to get a handle on it, it would eventually start to decrease. It would be reevaluated each year, and if not as much money was needed the following year, then that amount would be decreased. All right, thank you. So uh, traditionally in the last few years, we've made opportunity for members of the audience, even staff and or uh, media, or dare I say it, even councillors from other communities, Oh, okay, maybe not the last one. Uh, ultimately, is there anyone in the gallery that has a question on these items? Because if you do, I can ask for a quick motion uh, to recess to enable a question. If not, that's fine too. But uh, we want you to be able to participate if you so choose to do so. I don't see any yet, so we'll carry on. So go ahead, Pamela, please carry us to the next page. Okay, one quick question, Councillor Paul davidson Thank you very much. In regards to the Shelley Road Centre and the, the exterior painting, um, do we not have um, an organization that's in there, and are they not responsible for the upkeep of the center? Go ahead, Mr. Manson. Uh, if I may, Your Worship, um, yes, we do have an organization uh, there, but in um, part of the terms of the agreement is that the city is responsible for capital items, I believe, in the excess of $2,000. Um, therefore, it's our responsibility. All right, thank you. Pamela, please continue. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I'd just like to remind Council that they do have the package of all this, uh, all the spending package items that um, shows the benefits, uh, hopefully for the city, so that they consider these items at, you know, at their own time. So moving on from the operating packages into the capital packages, there is the business licensing upgrade the service connection software, and this is the item that's linked with the co-op student in the operating fund. If this, if the service connection is not approved, then basically there wouldn't be any need for the co-op student because it'd be the co-op student that would be entering the data into the service connection software. Then there's the drainage and erosion control at the hovercraft site in Community Park and the Sutherland Stairs upgrade. So those are all of the spending packages that were put forward for Council's consideration. Okay, and, and because it's probably good to have this discussion since there may be people watching at home as well, uh, and Council just received the details since this is the beginning of the process. Can you just touch us uh, on the um, what is really implied with the drainage and erosion control and the Sutherland Stairs upgrade? Can we get a little bit of background on that? If I may, Your Worship, uh, the... Um, drainage and erosion control of the community park. Right now there's been significant, uh, in the last winter because of the king tides and the storms that we received, there's been significant uh, impact on Arbutus Point, which is the hovercraft, the old hovercraft point. Um, basically there's an outfall there for the community park that's been impacted. Um, uh, that has been um, an issue for a number of years with maintenance and with the, with the recent uh, storms it's, it's become a more significant problem. Um, not allowing um, uh, much of the park to be drained uh, out to the ocean. Uh, there's also erosion of the beach at that point um, to the extent where we've, put, we've had to put up barricades because of the drop-off that was created there as a, as a hazard. Um, 
just a little nervous about leaving it any longer um, than doing something about it next year. If it has to go through two winters, it could it could have significant impact on uh, on that point and and significant damage. So that's uh, that's what the drainage and erosion control community park. So I've noted that uh, the hovercraft pad. I note that there's sometimes pooling of water there, and it's not draining. I presume that's related then to what you're stating. Yes, that's correct. Did you have something to add, Mr. Metcalf? Well, I'll answer the question, Your Worship, with regards to the Sutherland Stairs. Uh, the Sutherland Stairs, there's two components to it. There's the um, it, it wood risers and or an asphalt treads on the way down. At the bottom of the stairs, there's a section of concrete steps, um, and it's in the spending packages that, that will be included, but there's photos of it, and, and what's occurring is actually those stairs are being eroded behind, uh, so it's becoming quickly uh, quickly becoming unsafe. Um, we'll, we're going to get them assessed to make sure that they're safe, but if that erosion was to continue, the bottom section of the stairs would become unusable. So the top section of the stairs, they do need some work, but we'll do that under our normal operating for, uh, for that, like in terms of changing wood and fixing the stairs. But it's more the bottom section that we're really not sure of what to do with the concrete steps at this point, because that the bank there is starting to erode and causing erosion behind the stairs. So that's what that one is. All right, thank you. Further comments from members of council? Go ahead, Councillor Greer. Thank you, Your Worship. I was going to ask the <clears throat> Ask about the co-op student for the engineering department at 16,000, and now I see the service connection software. This has got to do with that person, and so now we're looking at what 27,000 dollars. How important is that? Go ahead, uh, Mr. Figuera. Mayor, Your Worship, um, through the councillor. Um, basically, uh, traditionally, the uh, connection permit issuance and the records that are held for connections for every single lot that's in the in the city traditionally that's um, that's held in engineering and uh, the permits are issued issued by engineering and, and I would assume that in, it, in the past because of the staffing issues um, challenges in the in the engineering department that we've had in the past that function went up to um, the building department um, and uh, and they were uh, controlling that. And uh, there are some uh, service cards that were being created for developments as they came in or building permits that would come in. Uh, now that's not being supported up there. They, they don't have the, uh, the staffing to be able to, be able to continue that. Um, so the idea is for engineering to take that back over. It is traditional engineering would do that. Uh, it's very important to have uh, accurate records of where all of our connections are for all of our lots. As you can imagine, a developer comes in and, and puts in a, a development permit or a building permit. Uh, we, we need to know where those connections are, or what condition they're in. Uh, otherwise, we're doing some exploratory digging out there and, and trying to find out where these connections are, or we just end up issuing, well, you need new connections, whereas they could have actually used uh, a reasonable connection if we had the location of it out there. So this is very important. Um, it saves us uh, a lot of field investigation time. Uh, it could save the developers a lot of money too by doing this. So it's uh, uh, it's really needed. And uh, the idea with a student is to to hire a student to put in all that connection information that's uh, on cards up here. Some of the, much of it is is outdated. So there's going to be some field work as well to confirm the information. Uh, and also some as-built entering um, so that in the end we have the best information we possibly can on our connections. Um, and it's recorded electronically. Uh, the software is a module of Tempest, which we've adopted. So we can, it can tie into our financials that way too. Just one follow-up. So okay, um, this is a co-op student. So are we looking at a full-time eight hours a day for the summer or for six months or? That's correct. It's, it's for the summertime. So he's able to do all of that in a couple of months? Or she? Or she. <laughs> for the four months. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Did you want to say something, Mr. Manson? Yeah. Um, if I may, Your Worship, just to emphasize um, uh, what the Director of Engineering was saying, uh, right now all that information is on uh, literally recipe cards. Uh, yeah. There's little boxes that you would normally have a recipe recipe for baking chocolate chip cookies 
Um, there are several uh, boxes of those. That's where the information is stored right now. Uh, so what this student would be would be or would be doing would be to taking uh, that information off of the hard copy or the hard copy recipe cards, um, putting it into the consu uh, computer system in this software connection software. Uh, so then it would be available to everybody uh, sitting at their terminal, as opposed to getting up, sorting through these things, picking out the right one. Um, and doing not very efficient. No, and, not very And efficient. dangerous in the sense that we could lose that information. One fire, one issue like that, and we're toast. Okay, so uh, further comments, or can we carry on? All right, Ms. Logo, continue. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, for the calculations of the budget, these spending packages have been included. So the uh, financial information that is will be provided to you have all these items included in them as well. Okay. So now we're looking at the service priorities that have been developed and we, are, again, one of our building blocks was to keep the bottom four levels the same as the 2012 levels. So here's a comparison between the 2014 levels and the 2012 levels. At the side, I have put the differences there. Totally overall, there is a reduction from the 2012 levels. Um, there is one area that actually increased where the others have decreased, but overall we have maintained that level beyond, uh, below the, the 2012 level. Very good. This oh, is hold on, hold on, we have a question here. Go ahead, Councilor. When, when will we see the 2013 report? They're not—they're not ready yet. Obviously, no. 2013 is no. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we'll have to. We'll only see 2013 next year. <laughs> yes. Let the record reflect. Uh, maybe a smart board might have helped in that scenario. All right. Go ahead, please. Thank, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, the next slide is a look at the costs of our 20-year capital plan for both our ma minor and major capital projects. Major capital projects being those that fall within the categories of tangible capital assets, which we now depreciate through PSAP, and the minor capital projects being the ones that don't meet the thresholds or don't meet the criteria, but are still uh, required to be, to be completed. So as you can see, over the next 20 years, we plan on spending $84 million in capital projects, both minor and major. This is a look at our provisional plan, the five years of the 2014 to 2018 provisional financial plan. Um, it outlines for you all the revenues, uh, so funding sources that we would be taking in within those five years and the expenditures that would be associated with them for the next five years. Those are the actual that we will get there then from there, the net income from the operations. And then following that, we go on to our capital expenditures and our debt considerations in order to come down to a balanced budget. So those are, again, for council's consideration. So with all the spending packages included and all the reviews and the minor adjustments that we have made to the, the budgets, this is what our projected unrestricted surplus will hopefully look like at the end of this six years. And the reason I put in six years is because you'll notice in 2018, the uh, unrestricted surplus actually dips less than the $1 million, which we recommend that we have in, in the reserve at all times. So that is just basically a blip in the map based on the amount of capital that's probably going to be utilized that year. But then the following year, it does come back over our $1 million level. All right, very good. The only comment I would make, um, obviously accumulated surplus are very important. That's how we ensure that we have cash at hand and as well as monies available to carry on our capital projects. But just to put this into context, not to delay us too long here, uh, having just come back from some very interesting meetings uh, regarding uh, the province, 
The province has an approximate $44 billion budget. That's generally the budget for the province. And they are forecasting a surplus of $146 million on $44 billion. Now, you can imagine the difference, whereas we have, a, if we include fees, what, about a $15 million a year budget, I would say. And, uh, and to have this kind of a healthy surplus, uh, I think, speaks volumes of what has been, I think, very good stewardship of uh, tax dollars and gives us certainly room to breathe. Thank you, Worship. Um, I would like to make a, a very small suggestion simply because we see from time to time in the newspapers reports by the Taxpayers Federation and folks saying you know, they're throwing percentages around uh, very, very freely. On the 20-year capital plan from 2014 to 2018, could could you give the the, the percentage uh, if, if that that could be included in there in terms of what the percentage represents one percent two percent that sort of thing I, it, because that's that's the thing that we get hit with you know how, why do you have a ten percent increase or a three percent increase we don't we don't have that though. I, when I look at, and I look at the the 2014-18 provisional fi, provisional financial plan when I look at the um, the revenues and the uh, the expenditures, uh, the percentages are are, are extremely uh, modest. So, I would I would I would suggest that the percentages be put in there, and um, and so that could be referred to. It's a two percent or one percent or one point eight percent. All right. Thank you. Further comments from council? Keeping in mind that we're introducing this, we don't have to solve this today, but this is. Uh, our opportunity to start studying it a little further and come back at some later time to uh, ratify at least that provisional level. How much further of a presentation do you have? That much? Okay, you want to carry forward and then we'll again make the opportunity uh, for anyone who wishes to ask questions. Go ahead. So that completes the general fund. So now we just move on to the water fund. The building blocks for the water fund, uh, rate increases of 5% for 2014 to 2016, 2% for 2017 to 2021, and 1% from 2022 to 2033. Also in this model, we have long-term borrowing in 2015 and 2016 of $8 million a year. All right, uh, Councillor Morrison. Uh, you, just one quick question. We always. Um each year we've gone through these and it shows the 5% increase and then later on the business rates come out. I'm just wondering whether they could be included on the pages as the, these are the residential rates and the business rates would be this much included beside it, just so we have a general idea of what the businesses are increased as well, commercial. Are these percentages, you're talking about increases in the fund itself or projected need? Right, okay, so um, is Councillor Morrison's suggestion something we can implement? Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Mr. Brotherworth. I believe these 5% rates uh, apply to both residential and commercial, so I don't know if there's a need to show them separately, but uh, we could have both, but it's the same, same increase. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Moving on, the budget adjustments for the water fund. In the capital, we removed eight DCC projects that did not meet our amended criteria for DCCs. Um, the Hearst Avenue Macmillan to Moliette project sees an increase of 113,800, and we've added Ermine Skin water replacement for 227,000. That's also uh, included in part of the, the justification for that is in your spending package. And again, we adjusted the reserve balances. Can you, uh, sorry, can you just go back to that last slide and? Um, was your question related to this slide, Councillor Greer? Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, just the removal of eight DCC, eight DCC projects that did not meet amended criteria. Are they the ones that were going to go, uh, be in, uh, initiated this year? Go ahead, Mr. Figuera. If I may, Your Worship, uh, through to Councillor Greer. Uh, these eight DCC projects um, Basically, the amended criteria, engineering staff has gone back to the best management practices for the DCC and, and take a really good look at the, uh, the um, criteria 
and uh, our interpretation of it uh, once we took a look at these eight BCC projects which uh, which are spread out through I believe they were spread out through through the 20 years yes yeah, not oh, all in one okay. spread out through the 20 years we uh, we um, judge our judgment was that they, they should be removed from the program okay and so that's based on best practices using the best practice guidelines okay carry on please thank you your worship so the service priority levels for the water um, again comparing 2014 to 2012 these actually are bottom two are a little bit higher but they're still very very close The 20-year capital plan for the water fund in the full 20 years, again, this is minor and major capital, is for a total of 48 million. And the underneath part is the funding sources where it's actually coming from, operations, capital, and so on. And just for clarity, as is always the case, we are making assumptions here that we will not be receiving any significant funding. Not that we expect that, but just right. from a budgeting perspective, this is based on the very unlikely and would make us very upset scenario of having no additional outside funding for major capital, right? So this right. is the worst case scenario, in effect. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you, Your Worship. That's correct. Um, this is the Water Fund financial plan for the for the five years. Again, the funding sources, the expenditures that are associated with those funding sources, and then the capital and the debt. Uh, below for a balanced budget for the five years. And based on the information that's in our water fund f provisional plan, this is how the um, un projected unrestricted surplus falls out. It does dip in 2016. That is when we are anticipating the construction of the water treatment plant and the first borrow, well, the first borrowing is coming in 2015 and the second borrowing in 2016. And then in 2017, it kind of comes back to its recommended $1 million level. So that's, that's the water fund. If there's any questions on the water fund. Any further questions on that? Looking out in the audience, are there any questions from anyone in the audience on that particular element? Right, no hands, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so for the sewer fund, the building blocks for the sewer fund are rate increases of 6% in 2014 and 5% from 2015 to 2033. The budget adjustments were again, we adjusted the reserve balances and on the capital side, we removed two DCC projects that did not meet the amended criteria. And these, again, were spread out throughout the 20-year capital plan. There was only one spending package for the sewer uh, utility fund. And again, that's part of the, the handout that you were given. And it's for three lift station hatches for both the Craig, uh, Craig Bay and the Martindale lift stations. The service priority levels compare again compared to uh, 2012. Um, overall, the service priorities are lower, but the organizational welfare is a little bit higher. The 20-year capital plan for the sewer fund. Um, basically, there are sewer assets, um, from what I understand from our director of engineering, are in very good shape, and we will only be requiring $9 million for our sewer uh, capital in the next 20 years, and that, again, is both minor and major capital. And again, underneath the funding sources for those capital. The actual financials for the sewer fund, the funding sources and the expenditures, and again, the um, any capital expenditures and any debt or borrowing within the next five years to make a balanced budget. And lastly, um, the projected unrestricted surpluses for the sewer utility fund. In 2014, we start out with 1.6 million and we do end up with only 600,000 in 2018. 
Um, 2019 actually is also low as well. The sewer fund does um, does not come back up to a million dollars for a couple of years after. So we may have to revisit um, increases or whatever um, later down the road for that. But right now, based on what we have in the in the budget, um, that's what we're projecting. All right, so thank, thank you, you very much. And if you have any questions. All right, so are there any further general questions? Go ahead, Councillor Neufeld. Thanks very much, Your Worship. Uh, Pamela, thank you very much. It was a good presentation. I enjoyed that. Uh, I'm not sure if Mr. Greer uh, did. Uh, he doesn't like spending money, nor do I. And that really brings me to the question. Um, if we go to the water fund, uh, long-term borrowing in 2015-2016, uh, there's $8 million a year there. Perhaps I should uh, address this to Mr. Manson or, or to uh, you, uh, I'll Mr. address Mayor. it to myself, and I'll try to direct it to the appropriate okay, person. Okay, if you would, please. The, um, we're, we're, we're looking at uh, borrowing $16 million. Uh, do, we, do we have any good figures as to uh, that's the money that we are actually going to need? Uh, do we have any commitment from any other uh, senior government that uh, we will be doing uh, getting some, some additional uh, funding for um, our, our water treatment center and, and plant and um, the intake. Uh, what, what is the situation at the present time as far as um, uh, monies that we uh, can expect and monies that we can think about having to borrow? If you okay. Please. I think I can answer part of that, but certainly if I don't fully, I'll direct it to a staff member as well. Um, as we were suggesting, the dollars that you see in that plan are under the assumption that, no, we're not getting any senior funding, okay, just as a worst-case scenario. Um, in terms of the overall commitment, I've made arrangements for both our MLA and our MP to meet once we have something a little bit further and substantive to report on our ASR, and also talked with the uh, Minister of Municipal Affairs, uh, Coralie Oaks, at our last conference about getting together. Uh, and it is a, around the time now to really start putting a, a press on in terms of the need for uh, senior level funding. I've also uh, requested from both the Chamber and the uh, Oceanside Development Construction Association that they also make appointments with our MP to talk about it from an economic development perspective, the need for that capital infusion, because obviously if we get those dollars, it's going to help reduce any DCC increases substantially. And um, we are right now in a testing phase with ASR. Uh, once we have a better understanding and determination of how effective that will be, that will then uh, allow us to move into a more detailed planning phase on the actual water treatment plant. And I believe we are beginning the process of a detailed design on the water intake, which we now have confirmation in terms of where it can go. And uh, until we have those details, of course, it's very difficult to request funding directly. Um, interesting, I mentioned this earlier, but I just think uh, it should be put out there. Uh, water, uh, water treatment plant is currently being constructed in Nanaimo. Uh, it's a $65 million project. Uh, they received uh, about $27 million in federal and provincial funding. Uh, I believe it was a split of $17 million between the two levels of government. And then through the Building Canada Fund, uh, there was an additional $10 million that was provided. There's also, as I think Council is aware, because I've been CCing you folks some of those concerns, uh, some concern right now amongst local governments clear across the country with regard to the future of the Building Canada Fund. There were some requests that came in from the City of Toronto, a rather substantive request, which was apparently granted. Um, and now uh, at the FCM level, there's lots of uh, discussion going w underway right now, trying to get a clear determination from the federal government that uh, they're not going to advance some of the dates, and that's a concern for us as well because we're not yet at a point where we can make a very specific ask based on some sound numbers and estimates. So uh, something we're monitoring very closely. And uh, I've expressed to staff in a staff meeting as recently as this morning that uh, as much as we can start to uh, advance and speed up some of these processes, and of course there's some limits to what we can do there, uh, we should likely be looking at that because we want to be in a position uh, we don't want to be the last out of the gate, in other words, uh, for federal funding, especially if indeed a whole bunch of communities are ahead of us and uh, they're deciding that they're going to spend a bunch of money real quick. So, uh, you know, the old shovel-ready thing. So um, definitely in, uh, in the works in a variety of fronts. Did that answer your questions? Did you need any further detail? No, that's fine. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So uh, next up is Councillor Powell-Davidson. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Through you, I believe to the Director of Operations, just in reference to the, um, the DCC projects that were moved in both the water and I believe in the sewer, there were two. Um, I guess I'm a bit confused. My question is if these are projects that were initially identified as needing to be done and then the criteria which are, are they going to get done at some point? Is there any risk factor in leaving them? Does it get more costly? C can you elaborate just a little bit more or can I have a bit more elaboration on what that means to remove Certainly. those in Certainly. terms of the integrity of our infrastructure? So, Mr. Figuera? Yeah, if I may, Your Worship, uh, through to uh, Councillor Paul davidson um, the, the, um, upon reviewing the, um, the best management practices on it, we looked at the criteria, and uh, these projects we felt did not meet, uh, meet the criteria. Um, it does not mean that uh, they will not get done. Uh, some of them really should, uh, an example is some of them um, would be done as, uh, as part of a development, but only um, really benefit a specific development. And shouldn't be um, shouldn't be taken on by by all the development community. So uh, that's just one example of, of the type of projects. So uh, in that particular case, when a particular when a lot is developed, um, they will build the, the the water main that they need. Um, that's just an example. I'll let you know. I, I don't know if that answers your your question. So these are projects that have a DCC component, right? And DCCs, of course, relate to the need for capacity and infrastructure. And we follow, or perhaps haven't been following, but are now more closely following the a best practices guide on how you determine what projects are applicable and what aren't. And staff, through following that process, have determined, I think, a sum total of 10 then in the various funds over a period of 20 years that ultimately should be recategorized. Would that be a better way to describe it? It's not that we're abandoning these projects. It's ultimately how they're financed. And, uh, and that is following, as we're being told, the best practices that are out there on it. That helps. OK, go ahead, Councillor Lefay. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, two, two separate questions uh, with regards to the Building, Can Building Canada Fund. Are there any other projects that are shelf ready if the Building Canada Fund asks us for some, some projects, um, say, on the 1st of January? That's the first question. That's the question we'll refer to the next meeting, probably, or did you want to take a stab at that, Mr. Manson? Um, if I may, Your Worship, as far as shelf ready, um, detailed design and that sort of thing, um, I would have to answer no. Um, we've got a 20, 20 uh, year capital plan with multiple projects in it. Um, the engineering department is working on the most current. Um, possibly, if something were to come up, one of those could be expedited uh, to take advantage of it. Uh, but to have the, the, you know, all of the detailed design work done and ready to go, uh, the answer would be no. Thank you. My second question is um, with regards to the water treatment plant, uh, is, the, is the criteria such that it basically has to be ready for, to go to tender, or is the criteria um, broad enough that we could, we could, uh, we could provide, um, obviously, some general to specific information in terms well, I mean, we know what kind of filters we want to use. We know where the location is going to be. We, we, we have some idea of the size. Would it be possible to get our ore in the water in terms of saying we would need approximately whatever, or, or is that, or is that not, does that not meet the criteria in terms of being shelf ready? Well, if I may, Your Worship, shelf ready in the the terms of the federal and provincial government. When I think it's shovel ready, by the way. Shovel ready, ready or whatever is is basically they want something built now. Um, when they have these programs or announce these programs, generally they're um, the type of program that they want done so that it can stimulate the economy, get people working right now. Uh, so that's the issue. Um, it's not a case of, of uh, um, whether it's feasible or we have um, good order, order of magnitude estimates or whatever. It's something that the de detailed design is done um, you have the plans ready. You can put it out for tender within a predetermined time, usually a year or maybe two at the most, uh, so that the contractors can get out there and get working. 
the limitations that we have right now really is the testing out of the practical use of the ASR wells. We're literally within the end game of determining that right now. So I would expect before Christmas we'll know the end result of that. And once we know that, then we can get into the detailed design, which would put us in the position of being able to go to the electorate and the federal and provincial government, hopefully for the November 2014 election for the referendum. Follow up, Your Worship. Go ahead. What I was thinking with regards to the treatment plant is that we need a new intake location. We need a new intake. We have identified the location. The intake itself, could that not be the start of, could that not be done on its own, on its own merit? And could not the shovel ready or the shelf ready plans and specs be prepared just for that aspect of it? Or do they have to work side by side or simultaneously? If I may, Your Worship, and I could be corrected by our Director of Engineering, part of the ASR component will dictate the size of the treatment plant and the capacity at any given time for the water to come out of the river and into the treatment plant. So if the ASR proves out the way we think it is, both the treatment plant and the intake can be smaller because we can draw out over a long period of time versus a short period of time if we don't have the ASR wells. And that's what's kind of holding us up. We want it to prove out so that it will save us a pile of money. Okay. Anyone else in the line that I didn't see your hand up in the air? Okay. So I do want to just mention something before we seek to, how would you like us to have this budget tabled or can we just leave it be and then you take the input that you've received here today and put it back forward? Do you want me to just simply table it or do we want to call another special meeting for this purpose? I would just receive it for information purposes at this point. Okay. So before we do that, though, I just want to talk about one other element and I'm going to ask a question of the staff. But for years now, literally years, I've had to listen to Councillor Lefebvre on my right go on and on and on about energy savings, about solar, about what we're doing about it. And it just so happens that I think with the increases in basically utility costs, with the fact that the city is approaching about $1,000 a day in electric use, and that includes everything, not just street lights, et cetera, I understand that staff are now finally underway, well, I shouldn't say finally, that the time is right, that there may be some feasibility in expending some capital in return for a fairly good and substantive savings on our utility side. Did you want to elaborate on that, Mr. Manson, at all? Because I think it's really important. Other than to say that, yes, we are looking into the feasibility of a whole range of energy savings and even energy generating options that we could use to wean us as much as possible off of BC Hydro and the rates that we're paying. And we are about $325 a year in hydro costs, including what the PCTC ultimately, or sorry, the Community and Conference Center also is incorporated in that number? They're both. We're well over $300,000 a year. So that's a substantive cost. That's a lot of room for us to look to improve upon. And, you know, if we can develop something, and whether it's panels on the roof of this building or whatever that ultimately is, and we can start to reduce that, I think with the right kinds of investments, and hopefully they're feasible, and it's your era now, Councillor Lefebvre, we might actually do something really good here in terms of reducing our overall costs. So I'll leave it at there. We're going to have – okay, go ahead, Councillor Lefebvre. Well, you opened up the topic, Mr. Mayor. I did. I'm glad to see that you're – my brow beating you is finally paying off. No, the – what I did notice the other day, and I can't use my new iPhone properly yet, so I couldn't take a picture, but I saw – Smart boards and iPhones, apparently. I know. I'm having trouble. I'm going to need some training. But I saw a 
a city light standard, fairly high one like we have on our highways. And what they have is a metal, uh, a metal arm with the, with the panel, with a solar panel on, on it. And obviously that's what's lighting up the, uh, with, with the light. So, I mean, the, the technology is obviously there. Now it's just a wait and see what kind of, well, no, but let's wait and see what kind of an increase BC Hydro is going to bring forward. And then let's do the cost benefit analysis because I would suspect if it's going to be 26.4%, it's going to become a no brainer. I, I actually think we're more than there in terms of cost benefit analysis. Um, I mean, there's enough that we're now uh, spending every year. Uh, you know, again, it's just at a point where we do that feasibility and see where we're at. But uh, this should be a priority for us. Uh, I think, um, and I know from discussions with staff, we are talking about solar powered lights and also about generating power and ultimately then taking it out of uh, what we're using right now. So, okay, go ahead, Councillor Greer. Thank you, Worship. I wouldn't get overly excited about it. I think within the next five to ten years, things are going to be much cheaper, much better, and it would be foolish for us to jump in with both feet and put all, install all this equipment and then find out in five or six years it's obsolete. So technology is changing so quickly that we better be careful on how much we spend and, and, um, and what the situation is because it's going to change very quickly over the next few years. Well, I'm sure when those reports come back from staff, we can have a good debate about it and we'll have much more detail to work with. All right, so I'm going to make a third and final Third, and, just give me bear with me. A third and final call to anyone in the audience that wishes to ask any questions. Now would be the time, at least for this session. So I do see a gentleman. So let me just uh, quickly uh, get a motion of council to recess so we can ask some questions. So Councillor Morrison, Councillor Powell, all in favor? Opposed? Carried. So go ahead, sir. Stand up. I'll repeat your question into the microphone just for anyone that may be watching or on a device. Okay. Okay, so um, the question is uh, surprise at our noxious weed program and a concern expressed over some of the continued unkept properties in the city, specifically the one here next. I assume we have not had any complaints regarding that property then. Okay. Okay. All right. So concern regarding this property, it should be cut. Is your okay. Right. Well of course noxious weeds are in a different category yet again, unless you're suggesting there are noxious weeds over there. Um, there are a very specified list of, you know, particularly bad uh, weeds and uh, as you heard earlier our a director of operations did indicate that we do have some problem areas in the city. But your point's well taken, and I, I tend to agree with you. I, I don't think it's the, one of the better kept properties. Any other questions before we come back into session? All right, so I need a motion to uh, readjourn. So moved by Councillor Morrison, seconded by Councillor Powell Davidson. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. All right, so we're back in meeting, and uh, now essentially I just need a motion to uh, receive the budget. So moved by Councillor Powell, seconded by Councillor Greer. And, uh